so in this very short lecture today we are going to talk about the important this topic which is heat transfer in our normal stars now in this figure you can see a normal star and uh, inside the star there is a certain layer now why have i drawn it the reason being that we know that the different layers of the stars transport heat outwards in different ways now what are the important ways well conduction convection and radiation but we do know that thermal conduction is important for the case of white dwarfs so for normal stars which we have here right now there will be competition between convection and radiative transfer so the question is whether for this star the outer zone will be the radiative zone and the inner zone will be the convective one or the inner one will be radiative and the outer will be convective so what is it going to be now before we move into the details regarding the solution we must remember that convection is the dominant mode of energy transport when the temperature gradient is steep enough so that a given parcel of gas within the star will continue to rise if it rises slightly by an adiabatic process in which case the rising parcel is buoyant and continues to rise if it is warmer than the surrounding gas now if the rising particle is cooler than the surrounding gas then it will fall back to its original height in regions of low temperature gradient this is important you must know that in regions of low temperature gradient and also low enough opacity to allow energy transport via radiation you see radiation is the dominant mode of energy transport so what does this mean this means that you see the internal structure of a main sequence star depends upon the mass of the star you see here the three cases i have shown demarcated the first one is the very low solar mass less than 0.5 solar mass stars next one is in this category and then the higher mass stars now how is it different as you can see here i have also shown the convective zone and also the radiative zone now you see let us first talk about this case here now you see for the stars in this energy range sorry in this mass range which includes our sun as well the hydrogen to helium fusion occurs primarily by proton proton chain now we do know that in this case we do not have a steep temperature gradient and so radiation dominates in the inner portion of the solar mass stars however the outer portion of such solar mass stars is cool enough that hydrogen is neutral and thus opaque to ultraviolet photons so that convection dominates therefore what we observe is that the solar mass stars have radiative cores here and convective envelopes in the outer portion of the star now what happens for the massive stars you see in this case here we are talking about masses greater than 1.5 solar masses the core temperature is about 1.8 into 10 to the power 7 kelvin so that hydrogen to helium fusion occurs primarily by the through the cno cycle now you will remember that I, we have already talked about this in our lectures that 
for the CNO cycle, the energy generation rate scales as the temperature to the 15th power, whereas the rate scales as the temperature to the 4th power in the proton-proton chains. So what does this mean? This means that due to the strong temperature sensitivity of the CNO cycle, the temperature gradient in the inner portion of the star here, the temperature gradient in the inner portion of the star is steep enough to make the core convective. Whereas you see in the outer portion of the star the temperature gradient is shallower. Although the temperature is high enough that the hydrogen is nearly fully ionized so that the star remains transparent to ultraviolet radiation. And as a result the massive stars have radiative envelope. Also, do note that the lowest mass main sequence stars have no radiation zone. The dominant energy transport mechanism throughout the star is convection. Okay, so we have talked about the three different scenarios so we also observe that whether we have radiative or convective core or envelope this depends entirely on the mass and the main reason is twofold first being the opacity and another being the energy production right you see why opacity? Again, let me just again repeat this. Why opacity? Well, we know that opacity comes from photons being absorbed to ionize or excite atoms. Now, stars like our sun have temperatures in the outer envelopes which are low enough that hydrogen is not ionized. And what happens as a result is that the higher energy photons from the interior of the star are easily absorbed by the hydrogen and so the outer portions of the low mass stars have higher opacity and are thus convective whereas for the high mass stars the temperature is high enough that the hydrogen stays ionized so our radiation is not so easily absorbed and as a result the High mass stars have radiative envelopes. So this is the first point and the next one being the energy production, right? Which we just talked about. That is low mass stars operate via the PP chain, which have relatively weak temperature dependence. Energy depends on T to the power four, roughly. And radiative transport can handle the energy flux here so that low mass stars have radiative cores whereas the high mass stars operate via the CNO cycle which has a much stronger temperature dependence energies of the order of 10 to the that means the temperature dependence right is of the order of t to the power 20 okay and this is very strong for radiative transport so that high mass stars have convective cores. So thus we found today that the fundamental difference between the structure of low mass and high mass stars is that the low mass star here we are talking about just these two cases right now. The low mass have radiative cores, convective envelopes whereas the high mass ones have convective cores as well as radiative envelopes. Okay, so after this, let me now talk about the second most uh, important point which I wanted to discuss with you. Now these two topics I am talking after our nuclear astrophysics lectures are more or less over because these two are connected with our main set of lectures on the topic of nuclear astrophysics or nucleosynthesis. So the first part was the heat generation in stars and the second one is the consequence. What are the various consequences 
of fusion reactions for stellar evolution. Now you can just see the onion shaped structure being here, shown here in the star. This is one of them, right? And we have also talked about this case in our class as well. Okay, now, so let me just talk about it. So what are the various consequences? Well, the first thing which comes to our mind is that you see, you must remember, I have, we have talked about this, you see, each successive reaction during the nucleosynthesis, that means hydrogen during hydrogen fusion, helium fusion, carbon, neon, oxygen, and so on and so forth, you remember that each successive reaction has a higher Coulomb barrier due to a higher charge of the nuclei. This means that a higher central temperature is needed for the successive reactions to occur. And this means that the core has to contract. Okay. So this was the first thing, first important consequence. The second one is that each successive reaction has a higher or steeper temperature dependence. We have just talked about it right now. So the temperature dependence for helium fusion is much more stronger than that for hydrogen fusion. Even in the hydrogen fusion, the temperature dependence for CNO cycle is even stronger than that for PP chain cycle. Sorry, PP chain. Okay. Now, this implies, what does this mean? Steeper temperature dependence. This means that it will occur more concentrated in the core of the star. That is, in a region that has lesser mass overall. Now, the third very interesting thing is that each successive reaction has a smaller delta M by M. That is, it produces less energy. You must remember we have talked about it during the details of the nucleosynthesis process. The Q value during the successive phases, they go or keep on decreasing, which means the reaction produces low, lesser energy, the successive ones. So the reaction rate has to be higher and the fusion faster to provide luminosity. Another interesting point is that for temperatures greater than 10 to the power 9 Kelvin, the neutrinos, they come into the picture. They play a very dominant role there. You see, they play a role overall. But for this particular temperature zone greater than 10 to the power 9 Kelvin, the neutrinos carry away a larger and larger fraction of the energy. Now this reduces the net energy production for the star and speeds up the evolution. And so there are so many interesting things, right? And what happens as a result of all this? You see, because the mass taking part in each successive fusion process is smaller than the one before, the chemical evolution of the star will develop into an onion skin model here. You see, with the most massive products, the, which, is, which are the latest in the center, surrounded by the concentric layers of less massive elements. Also, the lifetime of the successive evolution phases will be shorter and shorter. So, this is what I wanted to talk today.